no idea how boring you can sound when somebody reads out your CV. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, it, it is a real pleasure to be back in Dublin and back in Ireland because when I was running a clinical service, you sometimes used to ring us up with this air of desperation in your voice saying, with the team mind popping over and telling us what to do. And there was very much the sense of, are we doing the right thing by this child? And can you fix the child? Well, we're not in the business of fixing children. We're in the business of fixing systems so they can meet the needs of children. Um, so I think more and more these days I'm here in the role of a grandma because it's been a new experience in my life. And I sometimes take the eight-year-old to school and it's a very nice school and I can't help but sort of scan the class and I can see neurodiversity popping up. <laughs> and I am dying to say something, but I have to behave. Okay. So um, I've been instructed by ADHD Ireland to present fireworks. I'm not going to present fireworks because I think you've had two beautiful, um, you've had lots of wonderful presentations, but the two presentations from Ireland did it for me because you had a piece of exquisite qualitative research which said it all. And it was said by somebody who those of us in the forensic field have grown to be a bit fearful of these horrible human rights people who go around to make our life a misery. So when we opened the Adolescent Forensic Unit in Manchester, I had lots of people coming up, and it's great you're having one next year. I had lots of people, pompous people, coming up and telling me I was doing a wicked thing, I was detaining children, I was going to forcibly medicate them, and I would be in trouble. And I thought, bring it on. Um, but then I had this really diminutive lady, then known as Brenda Hoggett, lecturer in law at University of Manchester. Some of you may know her better as Lord Justice Hale, that of the big spider brooch, which certainly upset the Prime Minister. I must make any comment, this is being recorded. Um, and she said, um, you're going to have a lot of trouble here but do the right thing, think in a human rights approach. If you're really stuck on a bad night, you can phone me, and I did. And that's about linking and working with people. So that's the start of it. Um, now for the bad bit. I'm going to challenge everybody and hopefully upset everybody because I think that's the only way you can have fireworks. So there was the exquisite presentation on qualitative research and what that can mean. And then I thought, I really don't need to come and say anything now, because we had the last presentation that did things in the right way, got people together in the right way, put the knowledge together, asked what people want, and then put it in a wonderful marketing communications in that video. And I would only challenge I would make now is that it's such a fantastic product, you need to stretch it back. Because I am a child forensic psychiatrist, but I learned five years into my job and I have, in fact, spent more time in secure custody, starting at Strange Ways Prison, than I've worked out a double life sentencer. Mm -hmm. And I was the only girl in Strange Ways Prison when we started, and they had to accommodate my special needs because I needed a female toilet. <laughs> but I learnt I wasn't going to avail myself of this toilet because it meant in a Victorian prison doing the walk across the middle of the prison and everybody in the prison knew there was only one place I was going. I was going to have a Jimmy Riddle. So there was no point. So I, I learned bladder control. Now, why am I saying this to you? Because that was really helpful around childbirth because I never had a problem, girls. Okay. I don't know how you're going to do this on video, but anyway, that's your problem. Okay. So I do, and I do believe in getting in the shoes, and it suddenly struck me, I'm a social scientist. I, I used to do group psychotherapy with violent and aggressive men who I wouldn't even notice if they got neurodiversity to the smell of Boddington's Brewery every time they brewed up the beer every month. And eventually, I ended up with three people, granddad, father, and son from the same family, and suddenly something, what is it about this generational thing? And then I discovered neurodiversity. And I discovered that the best thing to do in life would be to be a public health doctor and a social scientist. But I'd committed myself. So that's the good news, and I am watching the time. So 
to be serious, if you look at any, um, I, I better declare my interest in some of my roles. I am chair of the Centre for Mental Health, and it's a great privilege that Keith Bradley's been mentioned more than once. He's one of my trustees, and that's brilliant to have him there. Um, but uh, the other roles I hold, I've finished in clinical practice now because I took up the role of chairing the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges. I elected, I, I chose to do this job and a senior civil servant said to me, this is all the presidents of all the colleges across the UK. He said, why on earth do you want to do this job? It's like herding pedigree cats. Why would you want to do it? And I thought, well, it's my opportunity to get the mental health and neurodiversity out to the whole of medicine, to seize your opportunities. Um, I um, have worked for health education in England and there at the moment, uh, people have mentioned the workforce but not as much as I thought. You, you all say we, we've got too much demand, we haven't got enough capacity. Well actually what you mean is you haven't got the right sort in enough volume of the right sort of workforce and you're not actually digging into what the workforce means because the workforce means all the voluntary sector, it means every child, every adolescent, every adult, every elder in Ireland because that's what you're going to need to turn this round. And if that wonderful video could go back a bit into a public health and you talk to a public health doctor, you could turn that video into something that could go on, we don't have hoardings anymore, don't we have these big fancy screens in the middle of Dublin, and you could explain to people what neurodiversity is, because you're trying to get people and ministers to commit to something they do not understand. Now why, I, I'm totally abandoning my um, PowerPoint, you can have it, but I wouldn't, it's boring. <laughs> um, wh why would you do that? So I, I'm sorry, I have a very lateral thinking brain, you're going to have to cope with it. Um, so in 2008, um, somebody kept saying, oh, maybe you've got a few leadership qualities here. I was an officer at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I got, I shouldn't say this, I got a first class freebie trip to America. And I sat at the feet of Don Berwick, who is the founder of anything to do with health that is wisdom. And to be honest with you, I'm a bit of a fidgety person. I got fed up and I said, can I go and see somebody who runs education? And I met this wonderful lady and I thought, she's a bit dressed up today. She said, have you got your passport with you? And I said, yes. So off we went and I listened to Barack Obama give his first speech and his presidential campaign. And what was that speech about? It was about parity for mental health. And where had that come from? Parity, the concept, those of you human rights lawyers will know, it came from the civil rights movement in the States. And I thought, that's interesting. And I'm a bit of a hoarder, so I put it on the shelf. And then I cut it off the shelf in 2012. And I know you've heard of people talking about England, but I can't explain it without doing that. So we had, I was president of the Royal College of Society, and we had this toxic health and social care bill, which was going to fragment the whole of health. And we realised eventually it was going to go through. And I thought, well, how can I take advantage of this otherwise toxic bill? So I said, we'd like parity for mental health and learning disability. And I can remember a very nice minister sort of patting me on the head and, yeah, but you've got that. You know, we always include mental health and learning disability. So I didn't look angry. I didn't look frustrated. I said, can I meet you again next week? I'd like to bring some colleagues with me. Yes, OK. So the colleagues I brought with me were from our Users and Carers Forum, who represented every mental disorder and neurodiversity that I could find. Together, they were what I can only describe as a feisty but informed group. <laughs> and they said that, that really I was not doing a good enough job. I was a failure. Where's this going? Um, but actually, they wanted parity on the face of the bill, and they wanted it enshrined in legislation. Cut a long story short, we got it. And then my colleague said, well, what's all this parity of esteem? What's that got to do with the price of sliced bread? That's no use to you. I said, it's of use if you know, if you understand the legislation, if you know how to use it, and you know how to use it well. So the reason we ended up with a low age of criminal responsibility in England since 1963, and it got lowered because we dole our income packs, which the lawyers will know about, got removed, was because the lawyers were using it as a defence for anything. It was there for a defence where a child had committed a, 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 a serious crime. But some clever solicitors thought they'd use it for theft of a bicycle. They misused, I think, that legislation. I've upset all the lawyers in the room, but I don't mind. I'll live with it. So where do I want to get to? 
So there is something I want to get to. Have patience with me. Ooh, keep going. Ah, there. So what is parity? It's an approach to better meet the needs of vulnerable groups. The overarching principle of parity movement is equality in access to care and improving the quality of care in the way resources are allocated. Would that be helpful for neurodiversity? Okay. So you need a parity test and you all need to get together and you have to decide who's going to lead this social movement. So who's going to be lead the parity leadership? And that will be all these people and we'll have no silo conversations. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Policy changes to promote parity. So in mental health, that was about stigma and, and uh, discrimination. But you don't call it that because that annoys the public because it suggests that they're discriminatory and stigmatising and people don't like being attacked. So you say it's about public and professional respect. Parity of outcomes because the medical part profession didn't get mental health. Parity of outcomes, preventing premature mortality. And in this way, I'll come back to that in a minute. Parity of care and treatment. Parity and integrated care, addressing multiple needs. Never talk about complexity. If you really want to put a minister off, do not use the word complexity, because it implies that he's got a reason to say it's in the too difficult to do box, so we won't do. And actually, subconsciously, you're thinking the same. So just say multiple needs. A parity approach to public health. So the best example in England was the dementia challenge where they taught um, checkout people at, on Tesco's how to have more patience when people were fundling with their change. And it was an awareness about dementia. And you could have the same thing in public health about how somebody with neurodiversity either serving somebody in a shop or the person being difficult about being served and have a conversation about that because this affects everybody. Parity across the life course, and of course we know that is the absolute thing for neurodiversity. Yeah? You don't suddenly pop up with neurodiversity at the age of 25, even though uh, I think the oldest diagnosis I made um, was in Broadmoor Prison when I was asked to see a man who was 56 because they thought he might have some developmental aspects. Well, after two minutes, I said, well, well he's, he's got autism, what's your problem? Um, I did this of good friends at psychiatrist asking whether he'd ever done anything nasty in his life apart from the homicide he'd been convicted for many years. And he said, oh, how do you know I killed two other people? So that's the nosiness of a forensic psychiatrist. Parity and funding, because you do need money, but not as much as you think. And parity and research. So I'm going to flip back to parity and research, because own up if you're researchers in the room. Own up. Confess that you're a researcher. I'm going to make you very upset. So, researchers love researching their pet projects, whether it's ADHD, autism, HIV in left-handed people living in one locality in North Wales, whatever it is. They love sticking to it. They love looking at the holy grail of randomised control trials. I have Andrew Dillon, who's the chief exec of NICE, on my trustee board at Centre for Mental Health, and even he will say randomised controls are A-OK, -okay, but actually, we need lived experience. And NICE guidelines have lived experience. Do you remember the days when lived experience were referred to as the grey literature? Yeah? We are moving on, but sometimes it's hard to remember. And what I want to argue is that, of course, we've researched health on research health models. And we've actually misinformed policymakers. So when you start looking at what disease was about. Lots of disease is about dis-ease, lack of comfort in yourself. And we looked at monocausal mono models of disease, and the one we really love is, is um, Ebola and flu and infectious diseases, because you can get your teeth into that and be very population-based. But we discovered, experience and research showed us that this approach is too simplistic, but then we use the complexity word. It's particularly unhelpful when considering chronic disease or mental health. I don't know whether people with neurodiversity would like to be labelled as having a chronic disease, so I might be offending you, or whether you'd like to be labelled as having a long-term condition. But please put a name to yourself so you can join forces with the hundreds and thousands of people who have long-term conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and diabetes. And the people now, because of the wonder of medical science, when I started work, 
Um, you only talked about children with cystic fibrosis because they didn't have the privilege of growing up into adulthood. So join unlikely fellows who can support you. I'm really going to upset you now because I think neurodiversity is caught somewhere in the midst of all this. And I don't think it's found its home. It was given a home, so I, I was uh, doing a child elective in child psychiatry. I was sent out to the midst of deepest Cheshire where there was a colony for people with epilepsy. There was a colony for people with learning disability. There was even a school that was very secure where people went round in circles and did this. And I was told it was all about Canner's syndrome. But where were you put policy-wise? You were put with mental health and learning disability, whilst the group of neurodiversity have a lot of physical health problems as well. It was probably the best <coughs> haven you could have, but you've always been positioned where you're not quite part of the family. And I actually think that's a problem. And it's personified by the statistics we have. Well, people with autism have high levels of mental health problems, yes. People with learning yes. And then it stops. Well, that's a given. They're going to have high levels of mental health problems. Well, why do you stand for that? It's not inevitable if we get in early enough. But it's become a given. It's become a mantra. And I, I'm not having a go at courts, and I think Ireland's a lot better, but sometimes courts can be a bit tricky when they look for cut and dried explanations of criminal behaviour, and there isn't a lot of room for nuance. So I was probably one of the most unpopular expert witnesses ever, uh, because I was quite willing to utter the immortal words, I don't know, and I'm not going to be led by a barrister for me saying something as absolute twaddle, not under any circumstances. And when I said I don't know, I'd see, you know, if I was appearing for the defence, I'd see the prosecution going, oh, we've got it, we've got it, and I'd see the defence going, oh. And I'd say under my breath, but just loud enough for the judge to hear, and neither does any other bugger know, because the evidence isn't there. So it, it's, it's about being honest. Right, I must not digress. I promised I wouldn't. OK, strip back that video to be a public health video on every bit of electronic uh, AI device that you can get a hold of going across television, going into a campaign. I want to go back a stage. So in this room, we will have people who care for people with neurodiversity. We will have people who have neurodiversity diagnosed. We will have people with neurodiversity that don't know they've got neurodiversity, but their colleagues, when they leave the room, say things like, well, he's a bit on the spectrum, isn't he? Um, so we're all in this party together, aren't we? OK? So I didn't understand anything about communication until 2013 when I had the absolute privilege next to our unit there was the then only secure unit at medium secure unit for people who lived in the wonderful world of silence they were deaf it's a beautiful world they use sign language in a very artistic way this group had mental illness often had autism often had learning disability had rancid physical poor physical health and had been through the criminal justice system and this speech and language therapist stood up and explained to me what communication was about. And she worked on this unit. I want you to think, is anybody from the Garda still left or probation? Any police, probation, social workers, juvenile justice? Yeah, okay. Anybody as a human being who knows somebody else? Yes, we're all there, good. So I just want you to bear in mind an encounter that you found a bit difficult. Now, it might be with your boss, for all I know. Or it might be with a really... Somebody who's in front of you, out on the street, who's frightening you. I think street triage is a really good thing. And go to Liverpool if you want to see street tri triage in action. <laughs> it's really good, because you, we've got medical students in Liverpool going out onto the street, helping people who are in difficulty, knowing how to communicate with them, and they're able to divert them into systems. And it's the best training medical students can have. They don't need to know the 56 causes of a rare syndrome because two weeks' time it'll be out of date because some Nobel Prize winner will have found a new causation. It's a waste of time. They need to know how to be human. So you need to ask for what you need. So think of this person who is presenting you in difficulties. Or, if you're honest, you may have been having a bad day and it, you might have been that person. What are we here for? To ask for what we need 
to express our likes and dislikes. So how many encounters uh, I have in my working life with young men who used to hide their knives in places that prisons couldn't find but used to come to my clinic and I think, I've got an itch, he's got a knife on him somewhere. Um, and they put their hoodie up and if I got any um, verbal um, interaction, forgive me, I like to use used examples, it would be fuck and off with expression. Uh, or they'd be completely silent. Or I get the, or I get the, or I get the. So we have various ways of expressing our likes and dislikes. We can express opinions well. You know, how much do we listen to people who've got neurodiversity and learning disability about expressing opinions? Have any of you heard of the Choosing Wisely campaign? It's a campaign that suggests that health professionals should have a bit more faith in their patients and involve them more in shared decision making. There, there's a bit of a thought, isn't it? You're all patients, so do you just dutifully turn up at the doctor and listen to what they're going to say? It's a problem in mental health. Because we've got so politically correct, we're even afraid to use the word mental illness in case it offends a user of services. So we talk about mental health issues. I won't go to the doctor. If I find a lump in my breast tonight, I'm not going to go and see my GP and say, I've got a breast issue. I'm going to say, I may be a doctor, but I'm actually shit scared. I might have cancer. Will you help me? What is the right thing to do? So reject something of someone, ask for information, but actually you then oblige to give that information in a helpful way. So does the medical profession give information to people in a helpful way? I'll leave you to think about that. To respond to others' questions, instructions, so then we get to the police interview with somebody with neurodiversity. To form relationships with others, well, that's when my, my lovely patients with neurodiversity would say, well, it's something, that's something for somebody else, that's not something for me, is it? Yeah? To express our feelings, to organise ourselves and make plans. People in neurodiversity can be very, very good at that, but not at the things that matter. And to solve problems. So it's just a few things to think about. So why did I say prevention, protection and provision? Uh, because it's, I'm not selling my book, I really don't mind whether it sells or not. But we did a book on justice for children and families, a developmental perspective. And it's about all legislation as it impacts on children in all circumstances in any court. And it really hit home to me that we'd really got it wrong in juvenile justice and criminal legislation when I read that chapter over to myself and had edited it. So prevention, protection and provision is what we're in the business of. And what we want adolescents to have, because that's what I deal with, is being able to have fairness, protection and autonomy. Why is it more difficult if you've got neurodiversity and you're a teenager? Well, get real. The developmental stage of adolescence is, is totally about making mistakes. I could give you an hour's lecture on what happens to the mesolimbic system while the prefrontal cortex is misbehaving and show you MRI scans lighting up and not. There's no need to do that. It's just really simple. Your hormones are going. And therefore, why don't we have more awareness that actually for people with neurodiversity, this can be a period of crucifixion. It is so difficult. And the transition from primary to secondary school. So that's why a rights-based approach, social identity approach to healthcare, values, not value-based practice. We all come in with prejudices into work, or we come in with skill sets that we don't bring <coughs> to work. That's even more annoying. We need emotional intelligence, and that's something that some parts of the population neurodiversity find difficult, but can be modelled and learnt. And we need to do it through intelligent kindness <coughs> and place-based health. So I'm just going to whip back to more... Um, just one drawing. Right, strip it back again. <laughs> what is this thing called mental health? You could always go back to a piece of international legislation or the World Health Organization. They both have the answer. So the definition in the World Health Organization of a chronic condition is that what you're in the business of is doing a diagnosis, but we've had lots of people tell us that with neurodiversity you've got sub-threshold diagnoses which have the same functional impairment as having a diagnosis. 
So you want a diagnosis, but most people want a diagnosis because they naively think treatment will follow. Well, in the field of neurodiversity, that doesn't always happen. But what you want is help either to improve your child's functioning, to help you go to bed at night without being worried stiff, and you all live in different social contexts. So there's a group in Liverpool called the Tulip Group who have in common, and they couldn't get help from anybody, that their children are violent towards them. It's very shameful for a man, the man of the family, to say, I'm frightened of my child, my female child. And one very bright spark put an advert in the paper. They all get together. They all meet. It's a very eclectic mix. So there's a professor. Uh, there's a lady of the night. There's a complete range of parents. But what they do is they bond together and they work together and they help and they support each other from diverse social contexts. But mental health is about realising your potential, cope with the normal stress of life, can learn and work productively and fruitfully, is able to contribute to his or her community. So when you're doing your, your sort of human rights bit, that's what you're asking for, yeah? And also, it's not static. So I get really annoyed that some people um, don't approve of me talking about juvenile psychopathy. But we now know that personality disorder that sometimes gets muddled up with neurodiversity, and there are some common pathways in the brain, it is, is something I shouldn't talk about. But the science now tells us it's got a strong, effective component. And at the heart of that is anxiety and the feeling you're not in control. That's critical in juvenile psychopathy because they've suffered so many adverse experiences. It's critical in neurodiversity. But people change. So the nights that thousands of children went into the Manchester arena, including those in neurodiversity, they were probably most of them healthy, a few were coping, maybe a couple were struggling. When they came out, they were all struggling. And we've had to tailor the disaster psychiatry input to those children to include children with neurodiversity and frame those inputs in a different way. So it, we, it, you don't know what's around the corner. I love pictures, so that's what children think about uh, mental health. That's what some children in Sefton uh, think about politicians. Uh, and uh, to get through what I want to finish, um, so what I want to give to you is the science of everything. A bit bold that, isn't it, on a Friday afternoon? Um, so we talk about the biopsychosocial model. So I'd like to talk about the socio-psycho-bio model. And I'd like to talk about the theory of spaces. So I'm a bit of a stargazer. Uh, so my grandson and I sort of look up into the clouded, soot-ridden Manchester sky in the forlorn hope we might see a star once in a while. Um, and uh, I'm interested, what astrophysicists are interested in it's not the galaxies, not even the black hole, it's the spaces in between. What the genomics DNA Nobel Prize winners are, they've decoded the DNA cycle, they know what they have to switch. Now that's going to be a big challenge for human rights and medical ethics as we go forward, isn't it? So that's another day's topic. But what they can't do, and the best example is cancer, they can't work out what is switching the genes on and off. What's switching the genes on and off is the space in between. And what is happening with human beings, it's the spaces in between. So uh, the taxi driver who brought me in, um, I won't mention the idyllic place in, in Ireland that he came from, but I'm, after admiring the picture of his grandchild on his little screen, because she was very pretty, um, there was a conversation about where did he come from. And he said, it's a nice community. He said, not many people know it that well. We all get together and we help each other out. So I said, Thank you, God. Shared social identity, group behaviour, sense of connection, support, meaning, control, few social and psychological resources, enhanced health and well-being. People ask me why children join gangs. I really don't, I, I can't understand why they don't all join gangs, because what they say to me, at least if I'm in a gang, I'm 50% safe. And we know that children with neurodiversity don't belong to a group, don't quite understand social identity, have never had one, 
And therefore, this gang leader who's very well at knowing what constitutes a gang cell, and I've done this with terrorist cells as well, and they really like having somebody with learning disability and neurodiversity because they can use their impulsivity or they can use their, here's the instruction, follow the instruction. And the gang leader knows how to give this instruction in a way that a person with slow social processing will understand. Go over there, steal that bike and stab him. Dum, 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 dum. And that was a boy who was um, 16. And the person who made the diagnosis was, a, I better not name, a rather crusty, bad-tempered judge who used to sit in Snaresbrook Court. And if you know Snaresbrook Court, it's not a pleasant experience. I think it's shut now. And he said, and the solicitor got on the phone to me, uh, the judge has just said he's made a diagnosis of autism and learning disability. I suppose I'll have to have one of these so-called experts to come and confirm that. Mm -hmm. The judge was right on all counts, and this boy had an IQ of 42. But he hadn't been picked up because his mother was proud of him, cared for him, turned him out to look right. He was quiet in school, didn't make a noise. Okay. Right, so let's quickly move on because the two things, I've got till four, is that right? Yep, okay. So I so I have to look at my notes and get it right. So let's look at number one. Let's find him. He's here somewhere. Um, I'm really privileged to, bizarrely, because um, I've got no qualifications to do it, uh, chair the um, UK Autistica Research Network. I suspect I was asked, because I like chairing groups that are going to be feisty, and I suspect what they thought was that the group that would be feisty on this group would be the users and carers. Now, I have to say, I'm, I'm really having a go at researchers and academics today, Fiona, uh, but the group that proves far more feisty have been the researchers. And I, I, I rely on the users and carers to get the researchers focused, saying that research needs to be relevant to us having improved outcomes. So Autista in 2019, and this video that you showed showed this much better, neurodevelopment conditions affect up to 10% of the population and include that long list that you showed up there, so I won't repeat it, all linked by their presence generally from the earliest stages of life and their connection to the developing brain. Fine. I'll miss the next bit. But what we haven't got yet, and are you up for this, are you willing to drop your differences across the lobbying groups of neurodiversity, and are you willing to use a campaign that's very, very hard-hitting? I am not, when I say this, lightening the camp people with HIV to people with neurodiversity, but that campaign was successful because it was so hard-hitting. So the Autism Dividend and Discover Autistica um, said the following, and it was the Personal Tragedies Public Crisis Report. Born with autism, you will on average die 16 years earlier than your peers. Premature mortality. Everybody talks about it in mental health now, we don't talk about it in neurodiversity. And then some clever politicians say, oh you mean suicide. I say, no I don't mean suicide. If you have learning disabilities, a third of autistic people do. Now, this is why you don't have to answer this question, but I much prefer you do. Will those who are over the age of 40 please raise your hand now? Leave your hand raised. Uh, if you have autism and learning disability, you are unlikely to live to see your 40th birthday. Why isn't that rammed through campaigns? That is disgusting and disgraceful. It makes human rights look a farce. So, um, I mustn't get too worked up, that doesn't work. The last two things I want to do is to just briefly mention, um, a, a, a previous speaker from the RCN talked about the wonderful work in Wales. Uh, my mother is Welsh and my roots are Celtic. And I was asked by the now First Minister, who is the Health Minister, to be the external advisor to a Together for Children and Young People's Mental Health Programme. Uh, and that's where the title came from to the talk. And uh, if you see an odd group of people who get together in Wales in a public house, don't be worried if when they greet each other they do this. <laughs> not this, not, not well done in death, but this. Um, because we developed a windscreen wiper, which was pre prevention, protection, provision in partnership. 
And to cut a long story short, we did the work exactly like the previous speaker did by getting people together who normally argued with each other or didn't understand each other. And we had endless patients in round tables. And everything was always about specialist cams don't see people quickly enough, they don't do enough, they don't do this, they don't do that. And specialist cams were withering on the vine. They were so burnt out that what we said, cams is everybody's business, every citizen, every child in Wales. And we got the young people and the carers to drive what the themes would be we'd look at. And the one thing that came out, because originally it wasn't going to have learning disability and neurodiversity, I said, no, 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 it's going in. But the users and carers helped explain why. So what I suggest you do is you invite Cathy Norton, who's a paediatrician, who developed this pathway. <coughs> and it's been a really good experience because if you talk to carers of people um, who eventually get a diagnosis of autism, they say, yeah, we wait and we wait, and then we don't get an offer. And are you surprised that we then use unevidence-based treatments because we want something? And what we did is we used the voluntary sector to give them support whilst they were on the waiting list. We trained the voluntary sector and, and the voluntary sector working in neurodiversity. And it, it worked really well because it was two benefits. One, if we found somebody, if they found somebody who was really high risk they were worried about, they could be fast-tracked on the waiting list. We persuaded the minister to give consultants and CAMS teams time to do consultation, because it's in the name, you're a consultant. And I said, you won't get the hit on reducing the waiting times if you do that, but if you're patient, because it's a four-year programme, you'll get the benefit, because the CAMS people won't burn out. They'll be able to meet the people who are irritating them by sending referrals they don't need to know. The people who are irritated by the CAMs will meet them and see that they're human beings and will be able to train them to know what to refer in an appropriate way. It's not perfect, but it's been good enough now to embed it into practice as normal, so I commend it to you. Right, the last bit you'd expect me to do in the two minutes I've got left is, um, oh, and the things we noticed was unprecedented demand, capacity insufficient, limited intervention, rural pressures. Does this sound a bit like Ireland? Mm -hmm. Uh, incompatible IT systems, I've not a clue about your IT systems. Um, different professional management lines of accountability, shorthand for silos. Workforce retention, recruitment and a medical model. Okay. So the last bit I want to um, put some colour into if I've got it. Ask your child psychiatrist about how they diagnose and formulate because it's really helpful. So they do multi-axial classifications. The first access is psychiatric illness which often has nothing in it. So neurodiversity people have sub-threshold diagnosis for loads of things, but don't hit it for a diagnosis. Specific learning disability access. We have a general learning disability access. We have physical illness, because that can make you very irritable and aggressive. Psychosocial factors and general social functioning, like disasters. And the quote from Autism is, no more likely to manifest self identically amongst autistic people than musicality or skills at football. That's what we should be saying to the outside world. We're not all the same. We have commonalities. So I'm just going to... I forgot two minutes left. Right, OK. So reasons for offending and types of offending, because you will expect me to tell you some gory tales with some blood and gore in it. I will not talk about individual cases. I will go to the grave without talking about individual cases, but my name is always linked to cases. So you know why. Aggression resulting from disruption of routines. I rest my case, move from primary school to secondary school. Primary schools can be very nurturing. Secondary schools, even well intended, can be the kiss of death for this group. And that can lead to problems. Crimes resulting from social naivety. I used to get in trouble with, with autism groups when I couldn't deny the facts, but by the time I finished clinical practice, half of the referrals into my service for sexual offending had neurodiversity and mainly autism. That was not their fault. We'd just not met their needs and understood them. Pursuit of special interests. Well, you know, it's great to be a stamp collector. I'm sure it's very exciting. I don't know. Is anybody a stamp collector? Don't put your hand up. No. Uh, but if you have a special fixed interest in weapons, military, poisons, so a set of sisters whose mother was a bit... I think in hindsight had ADHD, but her children had autism. She, um, she liked perfume, so she called one poison and the other Chanel. 
and they got together and, and the, the, the one who was had less learning disability did the planning about how to poison children in school and the other one who was slightly more impulsive did the poisoning of children in school. So that was an interesting referral. Fire and sadistic interest, experience of bullying and teasing. Why are schools and the police and psychiatrists surprised that a child who's had relentless, unceasing bullying and teasing eventually, like victims of domestic violence, women who have the slow burn defence, eventually, but with more planning, because that's what they can sit and do in their bedrooms, going to school one day and shove a knife in somebody's back. Why are we surprised? So we should just get over it and learn to deal with it. Okay, uh, hostility to family members, I've said. Sensory sensitivities, um, we've had passively following, I've done that. So I'm going to finish on a sensory story. So. This was a young man who I was involved in. He, he killed his social worker in the social work office. Not very nice, really. Uh, he'd had this social worker for about four months, and she was a really good social worker. And um, nobody seemed to have noticed that he'd got autism, but there we go. So that bit was easy to diagnose. But the judge, um, and you know, in England there's a big pressure that we mustn't delay with juveniles, we deal with as rapidly as possible. But the judge said, but Dr. Bell, I want to know why he did it. Why did he do it? Why did he do it to this victim? And we all know about displacement victims. And I said, well, this is going to take me some time. And I was seeing him in the secure unit, and we, we, we were doing really well. And then I knew I was getting to the difficult bit. So how do I show my patient, that I've got vulnerability and uncertainty. By then I'd fairly worked out why he did it in the way he did it. So I said, for this, for this session I'd like your key worker in, because I'm just not feeling at the top of my game today. I put that in language that somebody with autism would understand. And I always ask people, when I, when I interview a young person, about the actual index offence, what you have to bear in mind that most young people when they've just completed the act of murder, dissociate. They often then dissociate back to previous dissociative experiences with adverse child experiences. But I always ask them about the act of murder across the sensory modalities. What were you hearing? What were you seeing? What were you smelling and tasting? Well, you know, people say, are oh, you looking for epilepsy? Well, maybe, but not. Okay? But what were you hearing? And he froze, and I said, well, was it something about the social worker? And we went through what her voice was like. And then when I hit the button, because I knew what it was then, because I'd already interviewed mother, it was her high-pitched, screeching voice. That was it. That was the trigger. And I'd interviewed mother several times, and I actually had to leave the room. She was a very caring mother, but she had this awful, screechy voice, and I had to leave the room several times, because I was getting a bit sort of agitated. So um, I hope I've um, given you food for thought. I hope you are willing to be part of a parity movement for neurodiversity. And if we can do that, then fewer people will end up in the criminal justice system. And we won't be giving people, wonderful people working in the criminal justice system such an almost impossible job, for which I would like you now to thank them.